our final speaker. Um, thank you, uh, Lawrence. And, we, and Rick Johnson is here, and he did a, a, a talk on the canvas weave matching and found a, a match for one of our Vermeers recently, so that was extremely exciting. Um, he's published on that. And um, Ahmed is speaking tomorrow indeed, so tune in to that if you're not going to be here. Um, Dr. John R. Smith is the head of AI Tech for IBM Research Globally and leads IBM's R&D in division speech and language knowledge and interaction. He has driven the creation of audio visual recognition tools, medical image analysis, and augmented creativity for movie trailers, ad creation, and sports reel highlights. His work aims to show how AI might be used in creative industries and explores whether creativity can be analyzed and if artificial intelligence can be creative. Please welcome Dr. Smith. Thank you, Louisa, for the very kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. With so many amazing talks, uh, there, I feel immense pressure now to, to meet the standard that has been set, and also to close out the, the day. So I come back to this subject about creativity. So the question that I want to ask today is, can AI be creative? So as a research scientist and engineer, to me, creativity is all about the method. However, what truly creative people do, such as artists and, and filmmakers, seems to be all about magic. There's a quality in creativity that seems to be uniquely human. So it's where an inspiration or a leap of an idea seemingly comes out of nowhere. However, there have been so many recent amazing advances in AI, it seems only natural to ask the question, can AI be creative? So at IBM, we're building on a strong foundation of AI, and we're very interested in continuing the journey and asking questions like, can AI be creative? Uh, our innovation in the field of AI goes way back many decades. Some of the earliest work on computers that can play chess and, and checkers. We heard from Michael about Move 37. Uh, IBM has done pioneering work on uh, training Deep Blue to beat the world champion Garry Kasparov at, uh, at chess in 1997. Uh, more recently, uh, we did some of the fundamental work of the latest wave of AI around training a computer that we called Watson to beat the world champions at Jeopardy. And this is really a truly astounding accomplishment because essentially it meant that a computer using techniques like information retrieval combined with machine learning would be able to answer questions in a very human-like way. So with this, this solid base of, of innovation, we're seeing that AI is still evolving extremely rapidly. When we look across a broad field of technologies, everything from natural language processing and understanding to computer vision, speech recognition, uh, we see that capabilities are evolving extremely rapidly. So we, in, in the field of speech, we're clearly moving from the ability to recognize and transcribe what someone is saying uh, to providing nearly universal translation, even generating automatically expressive speech. In computer vision, we're moving from the ability to understand natural photos. Uh, we heard a lot about that today, the, the various ways that we can do that using deep learning, to understanding uh, more complex actions and activities and, and behaviors in, in video. Around faces, we have increasing ability not just to, to recognize faces, but to detect subtle moods and, and emotions even. So it's really such a strong foundation, it just seems natural to ask the question, so can AI be creative? So to study this problem, we looked at a, at a creative task that was really ideally suited to, to looking at this question. And that's the creative process of making movie trailers. Now the reason we picked movie trailers is because we can actually look at creativity as something that happens in a black box where we know something about the inputs into that black box 
and something about the outputs of that black box. So it's not something that's just being created out of thin air, but there's a process that's happening. So this is, this is the creative process. We have looked at this in the domain, in particular, of horror movies, so just coincidentally. Um, and there are lots of reasons why horror movies were also a good subject for this kind of analysis. Um, one is because the emotional content tends to be somewhat exaggerated, and you know these are things that the computer could really clue into. So in order to build our basic understanding for this creative process, we had to use some algorithms like computer vision to essentially give us a set of representations uh, for movies. So we use techniques and systems like IBM's uh, Watson uh, Visual Recognition Services. Uh, these are available really to any developer, anyone who wants to use them, they're, they're, they're in our cloud. Uh, they're very easy to use, uh, very self-serve for developers, and they do all kinds of things. They have been trained already, they know tens of thousands of, of different labels of uh, categories to describe images, everything across objects and scene types and people-related categories, uh, but it's also custom trainable. So if there are a set of categories that you're interested in, you can teach it essentially by giving it examples. And it will create a model for you, just for you, uh, that you can use and you can then send new images to it and it will label them automatically. So this is an example of the kinds of you know, basis of tools that we use to, to do the analysis. Now when we take those kinds of things and we apply them to something like movies, or, or horror movies in particular, one thing that we see is well, yeah, these, these computer vision techniques, uh, they can produce even a pretty fine grain labeling scene by scene as you go through the movie. So we can see here, you know, the computer is, is labeling and scoring all kinds of things, uh, locations, different objects that it sees, and so on. However, if we then aggregate all of this and we ask the computer, well, what is this, what is Psycho about? it gives us really something which is a, a very factual recounting. So it tells us that, you know, Psycho is about a fixer-upper house with a windshield wiper, <laughs> uh, back of a person, driving wheel, there is a shower curtain, and so on. So th these things are not necessarily wrong. It's actually picking up on, you know, some even pretty, you know, rare things, um, you know, across uh, distribution of, of, of I images, but Certainly it's missing something. I mean, this is not exactly what we want. Um, when we think about movies, movies are all about stories. And stories are all about communication. And communication is all about emotion. And emotion is all about multiple modalities. So we really need to go deeper here and, and have the computer cue in more to the emotional content of, of, these, of these movies. So to, to take a step in that direction, uh, we did a piece of work with Disney around training the computer to, to recognize uh, the most emotional moments of characters like C-3PO. And in order to do this, we essentially had to train the computer for different modalities, as I called them, but think of them as you know, sort of different dimensions. Uh, language, um, how emotion is conveyed in language, uh, sound, um, so do we hear music, uh, speech, including voice inflection, and so on. And also, you know, very appropriately here, uh, body movement and uh, body pose, and, and so on, which happened to be very apropos for C-3PO, uh, because if you know anything about the, the actor who, who played C-3PO, Anthony Daniels, uh, in real life he was a mime. So body, body gesture and body movement was, was actually very important for him to communicate. Of course, he couldn't move his face. Um, so that was essential. So we, um, so we trained the computer. We then went back and analyzed all of the Star Wars movies. And we said, here are the top 10 emotional moments of C-3PO. I'm just going to show you uh, the top one. We better go. Oh, Artu! 
want to wait for me? <laughs> so, sure enough, I, I did have the chance to meet Anthony Daniels and ask him, um, what's up with this, you know? And he said, exactly. He said, you know, that was a particular move when I was agitated that, you know, I would, I would convey through that particular body motion. So, um, so we're onto something here. Um, but of course, there's, there's more to it. Uh, to, to explore this one a little bit more, we did some work uh, at last year's Masters event, which is a golf event. And uh, we deployed a similar system at, at Wimbledon last year and also the, the US Open, where again, we focused on the modalities. So what we wanted to do is to have the computer essentially identify the most exciting moments uh, that were taking place in the, in, in the course of the event. But again, focusing on excitement as opposed to something which is based on uh, the scores and the ranking of players and so on. So we're looking for those subtle cues that tell us, you know, this moment is really special or different from the rest. And similarly, we used things you know, like the excitement in the commentator's voice. We called the system H5 because we looked for high fives. Um, you know, those kinds of things, the sound of the crowd, to tell us you know, those little clues that a certain moment was more exciting. So I'm going to show you just one of the moments. This was uh, from last year's Masters, and it was the top uh, most exciting moment as identified by the computer. To date. Down here midway in his in the afternoon, and we'd already seen a couple of aces by Lowry and Davis Love the third, and he liked it straight off the bat. The problem was JB Holmes's ball was in the way. He thought that hurt his chances, but then hello, <laughs> something else took place. <laughs> Eighteenth ace in Masters history. I'm still amazed by that one. Um, you know, incredible. So, so we can see the computer can be trained to pick out, you know, some of these more emotional, um, you know, at least in the case of sports, you know, these excitement-related uh, features. So, now that we have that as a basis, so if we turn our attention back to this creative task about creating movie trailers. Uh, the computer has these models. It can analyze the sound. Um, we, we, we essentially have the computer uh, build a feature space around sound that would report the valence and arousal of sound emotion. Uh, same for the visual dimension. Um, produce features related to visual sentiment combined with the more factual things like objects and scenes and, and, and so on. Uh, now be able to go through movies. So we focused on a corpus of the top 100 horror movies of all time and their trailers. And we essentially then had the computer go through and look at the trailers and say, well, what is it about the scenes that are in the trailers uh, that made them different? Why were they selected from, from, from the movies? So this, you could think of this almost as like a, you know, a data mining applied to historical movies. You know, it's, or it's a content mining in, in some sense. And this is really an ideal task for the computer. The computer can watch movies you know, all day, all, all night. The computer doesn't need popcorn. The computer you know, doesn't get scared with horror movies. And there's no reason why this has to be limited to just you know, the 100 movies we fed it. The computer could even watch every movie ever made. Um, you know, it has that, that potential. So we did this analysis, had the computer go through using this uh, feature space that we had built up and identify the principal dimensions that are responsible for the scenes that are in the trailers, the human-made trailers. And what we found when we did this basically statistical analysis, if we look at the top three dimensions of, of the clips, that make it into the trailers, they fit one of three uh, descriptions. Either they were suspenseful, scary, or tender. I mean, that's, you need the tender scenes, I guess, you know, even with horror, horror movie trailers. Um, but essentially, you know, all of that learning 
g gave a recipe. So to make a horror movie trailer, look, look for scenes from the movie that fit these characteristics. So that's what the, the data mining told us. So first thing we said was, okay, well, is this you know, really true and how do, we, how do we use it? So we went back to uh, one of the horror movies, uh, The Omen, uh, from the 1970s, and we looked at the human-made trailer, and sure enough, there were scenes that were seemingly fitting that profile. So we said, okay, well, if we had the computer pick the top scenes from those categories, what would it pick? So I'll just show you that. Let's start with the most scary scenes in The Omen, as they appear in order in the movie. <laughs> That was scary. Here are the most tender moments. Here are the most suspenseful parts. Signore, there is nothing there, only grace. Where is it? You will find it on the map. I am here to protect thee. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so we did this project overall with, uh, with Fox. And for the real test, uh, Fox uh, gave us a movie days before its release. Uh, this is a movie called Morgan. If you happen to be on a long flight, maybe you can find it there. That's where I saw it last. Um, it's a horror movie, but it's, also, it's a horror AI movie, they call it. Um, and so essentially, we got this movie days before its release. Uh, given what we learned, um, we fed the movie through this process, had the computer pick the top 10 scenes according to uh, those scenes being either suspenseful, scary, or tender. We gave those top 10 scenes to a film editor, our local IBM research resident film editor, and he made a trailer. The whole process took a day. The, the computer analysis took no time. You know, it took tens of minutes. You know, very, very, very short. So, you know, end to end, we turned this trailer around in, in a day, and uh, Fox immediately put it out to coincide with, with the movie release. Um, within a few days, it had a million views. I think it's more than three million views now on, on YouTube. And l let me play the, the trailer. Um, you can see that uh, despite this short turnaround time, um, we took something that, you know, is typically a three-month process for a production studio, and you know now we were able to turn it around in a, in a day and get something pretty interesting. It's first birthday. It exceeds our our wildest expectations. Nice to meet you, Morgan. Nice to meet you, Lee. I have a 13 year old daughter. You don't get to see her much anymore. What? Don't you go down there, Skip. Don't be afraid, Amy. I have to go say goodbye to Mother. So overall, the, f the feedback on the trailer has been really great. So not only has it gotten a lot of views, but the things that people said about it 
we were really very surprised, but also delighted. I mean, people called it uh, really creepy. Um, <laughs> people called it creepier than the original. I mean, these are things that we never could have imagined, you know, would be would be achieved. Um, but it was really, you know, quite, um, you know, quite a, a surprise for all of us. Um, but it really brings us back to, you know, the basic question here, you know, which is, so can AI really be creative? So in the grand scheme of, of things in this creative process, AI had a supporting role. You know, so AI did not make, make the trailer. And in fact, out of the 10 scenes that the computer picked, the film editor used nine, um, you know, rejected one uh, because he felt one of them was potentially a spoiler. There's a little bit of a twist and, and he didn't want to give it away. Um, but there's, of, of course, also an amazing a creative touch there from the film editor to put those things together. You saw how the computer put the clips from the omen together, right? I mean, not, you know, not compelling at all. So, um, so in the grand scheme of things, the, the magic of creativity was still principally a human endeavor. However, AI had an important role in many aspects. I mean, certainly one is the computer was able to acquire knowledge about what matters for understanding this kind of content. Uh, the fact that emotion is important uh, uh, sound-wise, uh, visually in the scenes. Um, AI was able to gain experience by going back and watching you know, all of these movies and, and these, these movie trailers. Um, the AI was also able to prepare for the task. It was um, able to look at uh, film trailers and, and the new film coming in. And perform all this analysis and even rank things and, and so on. Uh, but it still relied very heavily on, on the human skill here, ultimately, in the end. So I like to think of it as you know, the combination of the computer method still and, and, and the human magic. So where does this leave us? Well, I think we didn't necessarily answer the question that AI can be creative. Uh, but clearly, AI can assist humans in the, in the creative process. I think it also leads to potentially deeper questions like, you know, what is creativity? And is creativity a process or, or is it a, a product? Um, but I think one thing that we do know for sure is that this AI-assisted uh, human creativity is something that's here to stay. So I think on that note, I'll end. Thank you.